Hey everybody, welcome back. It is me, Ardalis, and in this short video, I'm gonna show you how to use primary constructors, some of the gotchas or, or problems you might run into, and my recommendations on how best to leverage this new c -sharp 12 feature. Let's get started. So in this code here, we're just gonna clear out the console because I'm gonna use .NET watch run so that you can see the changes as we go, and we'll display a little head headline here. I've got a couple of variables I'm setting up here. Uh, one is a vehicle, one is an array of these vehicles. Vehicle is defined right here. Uh, it is not using primary constructors, and you can see it has a regular old constructor right here that takes in a make and model and assigns them to these, these properties. We can also use uh, initializers if we want because they are specified with the init keyword. Um, but notice, and this is the reason why I'm showing you this, that we can give it just a default constructor as well. So I could come up here and create vehicle two and say that that just is a new vehicle. And this works just fine because there's nothing forcing us to specify these things that are in this other more specific constructor. All right, so if I, if I save that and we just jump to our output, you can see that so far we're not really printing anything. It's just saying primary constructors. All right, so now let's create a couple of new types. We'll create a class that has a primary constructor name and we'll use name to initialize a read-only property of capital name. And then just to show how it differs from a record, we'll also create a customer record that takes in a string name. So let's go up to the top here and just show what it looks like to create a couple of these. All right, so you can see in either case, we can create uh, this, this type and pass in a name, in this case, our Dallas. And then once we have that, we can reference those properties. You see we have customer.name. If we try and assign it, we're gonna get an error. And that's also true for customer records. So these both produce read-only properties. If we want to allow mutation, we could just modify those properties, of course. And in the case of the record, we'd have to write out that code ourselves. We wouldn't be able to use the short form of the record declaration. Another big difference between how records and classes work with this syntax is that a record is actually doing a bunch of source generation and producing some code for us, like overriding toString, for example and our primary constructor feature in classes does no such thing. ToString is totally unaffected. So when we print out this code, you're gonna see that for the class, it's just gonna print out the name of the type, which in this case is customer. There's no namespace or anything because I'm just in program.cs. And then customer record will also print out the type name, but then it will iterate through and give us all the property names and their values. So you can see here that it's giving us that data as well. That's just a feature of the record keyword. Now let's look at how we use these constructor variables inside of the code itself. So let's create a method on customer to do something. And inside of this do something method, we can try and reference the constructor parameter coming in through the primary constructor and the property, which is the capital name, and see how those vary. Okay, now the first thing you're gonna notice is that we have an error here, this is CS9124, saying that string name is captured into the state of the enclosing type and its value is also used to initialize a field property or event. This is a warning and I'm treating warnings as errors. And this is something that you can turn off, but you should avoid doing that. I'm gonna do it right now just so I can show you uh, the rest of this demo. But in your real code, you never want to, to turn this off. Instead, you want to basically avoid having this issue and I'll show you how at the end of the video. All right, so now that that is turned off, we don't have any errors, and what are we doing inside of do something? Well, we're gonna print out the property name, which should be the same as name. We're gonna print out the parameter name, which again, should be the same thing. Uh, then we're gonna make a change here. We're gonna assign name to name.toUpper, and because it's just a parameter, we can mutate it just like we can any other input parameter. There isn't any uh, mutation protection or read only or anything like that that you can apply at least not yet, to primary constructor arguments. Then down here, we're gonna print them out again. That's gonna be in reverse order, but it doesn't really matter. We're gonna print out the parameter and then finally the property once more. All right, so we just need to call this customer dot do something. All right, so when we've added this call to do something, let's look and see what that's going to do. Now, in this case, you see that the parameter changed values, uh, but the property didn't, right? The property stayed the same. So even though we had changed the thing that was setting the property, the, the property's value was set and, and didn't change. 
right? And that's what that parameter capture is talking about. We captured the value of that parameter at this point right here when we set the string name property. And then when we modified it down here, this had already taken place, right? And so it didn't affect the, the value of name, um, but it did still change the parameter when we refer to it again. And so this is one of the things you have to be aware of if you're gonna use primary constructors is that those parameters have scope for the entire class and anywhere in the class you can change their value and it will affect the next time something reads that value. In this case, this uh, call here to assign the name, that only happens during construction, so it's not gonna happen again later on in, in the course of the class's lifetime, but that doesn't mean that there won't be some other method that's referring to name and there it would get the new updated uh, uppercase value whenever that might happen. Now let's try and do the same thing with a customer record just to see what the difference might look like. So if we take this whole do something thing and put it in here, uh, you're gonna see it's a little bit different. For one, we don't have a name, so we don't we don't have any of that. Uh, we can't change name to name.toUpper. We can change name to name.toUpper on the property, right? But even that is not gonna work because it's an init only uh, property by default. So unless we explicitly create it and give it a setter, this is never gonna work. So we can just comment this one out. Uh, again, there's no name down here, so we don't have to worry about that. So at the end of the day, it's just gonna be, you know, we can print out the name twice and that's not terribly interesting. We know that that's gonna work the way we expect. So the only thing that's a little bit different here is this parameter that you can access anywhere. And I do wanna note that you can't reference it using this dot name, right? If you try, you're gonna get an error and it's gonna tell you that customer doesn't have a definition for name because it isn't on the customer type. It's not an instance value, it's a parameter. It's just a weird parameter that happens to have scope everywhere in the class. So you can't do that. Okay, great. So now we kind of understand how these parameters work and we can reference them anywhere inside of the uh, entire scope of the class. What about validation? What if I want to make sure that this name has a value, right? If I were doing a, a regular constructor, like on vehicle here, I could check make and I could say something like guard against null or empty make, right? And this is using a, a guard clause library. This is our dallas.guard clauses that uh, I, I support on NuGet, it's free, and it, it will do the check and it will assign the, the value after doing the check. So it's a little bit nicer than, than the throw uh, expressions that are now available in the framework. So you could do this to, to make or to model and it would make it so that you are pretty sure that at least if they call the constructor, these values are gonna be set to something that you expect, right? Doesn't help you with init properties, but we'll talk about that another time. All right, so down here, we'd like to do the same thing with this string name, and we can in, in one place, and that's right here. We can do the same guard dot against null or empty or, or whatever your guard clause might be. Uh, and here, we'll just wrap the name, and that's going to, again, ensure that we provide it with a name. And so if we come back up here and we say, hey, uh, I want to create a customer down here. We'll call it customer two, and we'll pass in an empty string, which is perfectly valid, and the compiler will be okay with that, right? Compiler is fine. But if we go look at our code now, you'll see we get this system to argument exception, required input name was empty, parameter name, blah, 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 right? So that's that's what we want. That's what we'd like to see, is that we can check those inputs. However, with this string name like this, we can only do that right here when we do this this check and then everywhere else inside our code we're going to use name right there's nothing that will prevent us from using name somewhere else right now in this case because this is going to run at constructor time it will prevent it so that that's actually helpful um, but if this check were, weren't on the constructor if it were happening somewhere else then it would be possible that we might be able to still get the underlying parameter somewhere in a way that hadn't been checked all right let's go back to talking about the constructor chaining that we can do so let's create a new type that has some of these vehicles. All right, so now we have a simple person class. It takes in through a primary constructor, first name, last name, age, and some array of vehicles. So we can add additional constructors here. And in this case, we're gonna say we could create someone with just a first name. Uh, and if we do, then it's going to chain to the primary constructor and pass in that, that first name that we were specifying as well as some default values that we want to use. 
So let's see what that looks like in our code. If we come back up here and we say var person equals new person, and we'll give us, you know, Steve Smith, blah, 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 um, vehicle one and two, okay, all right? That all compiles just fine. And if we wanna print out that person's name, since we overrode two string down here, right? We're gonna pass in first name and last name right there. That should work. So when I save this and we run it, I gotta get rid of that, uh, that other problem we've got. So when we run that, you can now see we've got Steve Smith right here, All right? But what if we don't want to specify the other constructor? Well, if we try and get rid of that, we're gonna get an error that says, a constructor declared in a type uh, with a parameter list must have this constructor initialized. So what this means is that these, this primary constructor is required and you can't create any other constructor that doesn't chain to it. So this is another feature that a lot of people overlook about primary constructors is that they become a required constructor that all things must pass through. Unfortunately, this is a required constructor with no constructor body. So you can't actually use it for something like validation because there isn't a place for you to put that code. Um, but it does at least give you a place to require uh, that all these values be a part of the constructor and at least accounted for. Now, if you wanna be able to support uh, a variety of different arguments in the constructor and you don't wanna to have to create a bunch of different constructor overloads, you can also use optional values on that constructor. So instead of having this here, now all the optional values need to be compile time constant. So for our array, we're gonna pass in null, which because I have nullable reference types enabled means we have to make it a nullable uh, array. And then all the other ones can have whatever value. Now, if you don't specify an optional parameter, just like with method optional parameters, right? You can't skip one. So they all have to appear at the end of the signature. And so if I skip having last name have an optional value, that means that it's gonna give me a compile error because it, want, it doesn't wanna let me have John as an optional value. So set that back to the way it was. And what that lets us do, of course, is now when we go to right line, uh, let's say person two, and we can just save our person equals new, and that's not gonna work. And our uh, new person, right? Then when we look at person two here, we're gonna see that it's John Doe, right? That's what we expect. All right, now let's talk about dependency injection for a moment. So imagine that you have some service and that service takes in some, you know, required thing that it needs. At the moment, it's gonna give us a warning that's treated as an error because we aren't actually using this parameter anywhere, but it does work just fine. Now inside of this, this class, we can go ahead and call that other service and everything will work just fine. However, doing it this way again is dangerous because this thing is mutable, right? So if I make some change to other service, if I assign it to something else, you know, say, you know, if other service is null, you know, throw an exception, or instead of throwing an exception, let's just assign it to something. Then we can use it here and it might be just fine, right? Down here, we'd have to have some class that implements it, right? But now this, this all compiles just fine, no errors, but we're mutating this parameter and we're referencing it now in multiple places. It's gonna be assigned at construction time and then we're gonna further assign it within some arbitrary method and anywhere else that we're using it, that could change the behavior, right? What if we get this wrong and we, we accidentally say, well, if it's not null, then we'll assign it to this, right? Now things are going to be, you know, a little bit weird. Here we're getting an error because it thought it might be null. Um, so we'll just put this bang operator on there to tell it, no, don't worry about it. But the point is that we are able to change this value somewhere else inside the code. So again, how do you fix this? How do you deal with this problem? And how do you deal with the fact that, you know, if you can't see what's up there and, and this method, let's say is, is really, really long, right? And there's a bunch of other stuff in here, so you can't even see the top of the method and you're working right here. That naming convention makes that look like either a method parameter or a local variable inside the method. So this looks like the scope is purely local to this method that I'm in. But in fact, the scope is global to that class, right? It's class level parameter. And there's nothing on it that really tells us that, right? 
Uh, it just says it's a parameter. It doesn't make it clear that it's a class parameter. What I prefer to do, and what I think is much safer, is to always assign these variables to a local private read-only field. If you do that, then first off, you're gonna get an, an error here because it's being captured and used somewhere else, right? That's a good thing. You want that error because that's gonna make sure that you don't use it somewhere else. So we can get rid of this null check and we can just here say, you know, other service dot do something. And at this point, the code is very clear, right? Everywhere that I use the underscore prefix, I know that's a private class level field. So when I see this, no matter what the context is, I will know that that's a private class level field. And it's not mutable because it's read only. It's only ever assigned by the incoming parameter. And if I even try to use that incoming parameter somewhere else, right, then I'm going to be uh, helped out by the compiler and it's going to tell me that I'm capturing it already in another location. I shouldn't do that. All right, so my recommendations for using primary constructors are go ahead and use them, especially for simple cases. Make sure that if you're going to validate them, that you validate them when you assign them to a property or to a field, right? So you can use guard clauses right at that point. Alternately, if you're using them for uh, services, you know, you can assign them to a private read-only field instead of a property. Again, if you need to do any checks, do them here, right? You can add uh, stuff like this to force it to be a certain thing if you want, uh, and, and that works fine. Any type of expression will work. You can also use guard clauses to check for null, empty, or other valid states. But by performing all that work here, essentially it's happening inside of the constructor. And so you're still getting those checks, even though you don't have an actual constructor method body to work in. Thanks for watching. If you like this, please like and subscribe, share it with your friends. Be sure to check out my other videos on things like DTOs and coding best practices. And I'll see you next time. Keep improving.